Um, so I realise I'm the, the last thing standing between you and your next caffeine fix, so I'll try and make this as painless as possible. Um, what, um, what I'm going to present is, when it appears, a, uh, a really unique partnership. It's a partnership that started um, just over a year ago as part of some new projects where we were exploring the Great Barrier Reef for corals uh, thriving under natural extremes. Um, and subsequently asking questions about how they so it might aid reef restoration. I'm, I'm not actually going to be presenting that today. I have no idea how to get this uh, presentation to the It's on. Okay. Um, so I'm not actually going to talk to you about that today. I'm just going to keep uh, winging it until it comes on. Um, what I am going to talk to you about is um, some side projects that are rapidly evolving through that partnership, which have become really exciting. And, and initially, it's a, a, you know, I think it's a fair thing to say it's a little bit of a distraction, but it's become a really enjoyable distraction, something that I've, that I've thrown myself into. Um, a new coral nursery. Um, and that evolved because we were working increasingly at our reef site, Opal Reef, that's a high value tourism site for it. Um, oh, it's going to be one of these presentations that lags, isn't it? And it's slow. Um, while we're waiting for that, I'll acknowledge the funders as well. Um, so like, there's some people I really want to thank for this. Um, a and Foundation have been fantastic in supporting where we've gotten to so far. National Geographic as well have been huge supporters of our team at the time. Um, but I also want to give a shout out to Kabrumpa. A lot of what I'm going to show you um, has really been helped with some invaluable discussions um, through, through navigating the complexities of establishing this um, this new nursery. So as um, Margot actually really elegantly introduced, um, GDR landscapes are rapidly changing, um, in particular the last few years through heatwave events, um, but they've been changing for some time through uh, pressing stresses, climate change, um, localised anthropogenic stresses. So, so we're starting to become used to, unfortunately, seeing reefs moving from the left uh, to the right that you see on this picture here. This is a particular problem for high-value reef sites, of course, and for those of you that have, I'm going to speak ahead of my slides because it's just taking so long to load. Um, for those of you that um, know Mark Spaulding's paper, um, he's done a really great job, his team produced a really great map of GBR um, tourism value. Um, so you can start to imagine and see where particular reef sites of interest are for restoration. And one type of such site that we, we've been working in Opal Reef um, was bang smack in the middle of that high value site, of course. Um, when you look at the data and the statistics, I'm not even pressing buttons now. Um, when you look at the statistics, there are 16 commercial moorings at this site. Um, it's the major reef site used by these two tour operators. Um, and importantly, it's the most accessible out of a reef site. Now, unfortunately, um, just like many other reef sites on the GBR in high value positions, um, it was subjected to the heat wave event and it's rapidly changed its landscape. Again, moving from the top left um, clockwise back around to the so it's actually really interesting when you have the time and the patience to look at this figure, um, just actually how dynamic the system is. Again, those of you that were in Lena's, uh, Lena Bay's session yesterday about adaptation, you can actually see patchiness in how this reef is responding and, and stressing over time. Sorry? I think so. I, I'm not sure if I'm pressing buttons or not. It's just sort of freestyling and I'm trying to catch up on the slides now. Um, so where Opal Reef has been left now um, is, is not, you know, it's not dead at all, of course, no reefs are dead, but it's incredibly patchy, it's heterogeneous, it's granulose, it's all of these terms we've heard over the last few days. What we're now seeing is some areas of the reef are thriving, some areas are incredibly damaged and impacted, and this causes real problems in terms of the value it's offering to the tour operators, of course. So we're really under great pressure then to think about well, how can we actually fast track recovery of this site? And this is where discussions with, uh, with, with everyone involved in this project was, let's start restoring the site. Let's do something proactive. Let's really um, do something meaningful. So in February this year, we had um, a permit granted, and we in, installed the first um, nursery at this site. We've since, um, this is just a general design. I'm going to kind of fast track through this a little bit. Um, the idea is we have these two by four platforms, aluminum frames, and we can sew corals on very, um, very well. So in the top right hand video, and I'm hoping it's not going to auto fast forward onto the next slide before it's finished. Um, what you can see is that these reef platforms are attached by small concrete blocks, which makes them highly mobile if you need to move them. Um, they're obviously um, not resisting the currents, so that's very important. Um, and you can generally see the incredibly low cost that's gone into this. So we're not throwing big dollars at this, and there's very good reason for that, of course, when you compare the Phoebe Storm reefs. Um, and we sew these corals onto the frame, we create a lot of nubbins, and the, the idea of doing this, this particular approach, is 
It's a very directed and targeted, there's a very specific reason we're taking this approach. Um, our, our collaborators in the Caribbean have obviously been working for many, many years doing this, and they typically use these large um, Acropora thicket frameworks, typically on frames. I have pressed the fast forward button, it's not doing it. Yeah. Um, okay, so here's just some pictures of us at work. We have a, a trough on the back of the <laughs> trough on the back of the boat. Um, again, very low cost, lots of volunteers involved in seeding the frames. Okay, I'm not pressing anything here, and it keeps going back and forth. Um, so on the right, left-hand picture is what the Caribbean is used to. Um, this is an option we don't really have at this reef site for two key reasons. The first is that these kinds of frames that you want to install, they create great habitats for crown and thorns and propellers. So the last thing we want to do is start creating havens for crowlers. Um, the other part is that, as I said, it's a patchy site, how it's been impacted. So actually, we are under great pressure, in a sense, in, in the restoration framework, to have a targeted <coughs> restoration and recovery approach. Um, and again, the value that the, the tourists place in coming to this reef site we heard in the previous talks is very different in, in a sense in terms of ecosystem service value than truly just restoring um, an entire ecological function. So when we started thinking about how do we want to seed these frames, yeah, what's the right species combination we need to do? So again, so that we don't waste our time and effort. We want to keep the cost low. So we, we, we visualize this framework. Um, you've got trade-offs. Okay, you have an ecological end goal of some sort, you have an ecosystem service value that you want to place on the system, so that brings inherent costs. But you, you also have the idea, what can be grown effectively? You don't want to waste your time um, trying to grow something that simply is going to die or have slow growth, unless you really want that species. So you can start to conceptualize this in quite a novel framework. And this is simply taking um, growth on the left-hand side, survivorship on the, uh, on the x-axis, and you create a landscape for return on effort. As you go from the bottom left-hand corner to the top right-hand corner, if you can improve your survivorship and you can improve your growth, you start to have your much greater return on effort. So this framework is really straightforward because we already have a lot of data available from the restoration community to date to start populating this landscape of information and start asking questions. Do we have the right return on effort for the cost right now? Can we improve that return on effort? Or consequently, if we're constrained with the, the level of cost, can we start to see down nurseries in the right way to maximize a combined return on effort? And I'll, I'll give you some examples of what I mean by that in a minute. So to really dig into the literature on this and think about this in a more quantitative framework, I can look at a brief literature search, just using some very constrained criteria. Um, and the key thing is I needed data where I can calculate percent growth in a certain way and survivorship. Um, and actually, when, when this search was finished, I ended up with 44 studies. I'm not, I'm not correct. Did you press the... Can you go back, please? Thank you. Um, so, of the 44 studies, uh, out of 108 that provided the data I needed, um, this provided 216 data points, so a good amount of data to start populating this. 52 species, 25 genera. So really building beautifully on, on what the previous talks have really um, presented so well in terms of the data that's actually out there. I couldn't use all of it. Um, okay, so there's a little caveat. I'm just going to sort of you know acknowledge for a second, and I'm going to gloss over it a little bit. So there's a small elephant in the room here. Um, there's a lot of conflicting variables when you start doing this and bringing all this data together. The first is that we know that survivorship and growth has some elements of time dependency according to the studies you look at. So on the, on the top figures, I've just had a little brief look at this. Okay, if you found a box box, if it's the sort of games you like to play. And you can start to ask questions about is there an optimum time for survivorship, etc. Okay, well actually it's very variable. The statistics don't fill anything out in terms of trends or significance actually. The same if you look at growth in terms of whether you use a nursery, an outfarm, or a transplant. So I'm kind of going to gloss over these because there's no real significant trends as such. There are some small points to be aware of, and I may touch on those afterwards. This is the really interesting part, actually, for me when we were looking at this. Was um, We also know that growth is dependent on the size of, of the individual you start. This is not new. This is not rocket science. Um, but you can actually see, if you sort of squint carefully at this figure, um, I have this bit of model function to it. I do have a model fit to it. You, you can see a sort of dog leg, okay? You have a certain range of size of right when you start of, that, that your growth rate is reasonably independent of. And that's really useful for us as practitioners to know. Once you reach a certain size, your growth return starts to decline. And, and again, I'm gonna come back to this. But this is a conflating variable in the figures I'm gonna show you in a minute, and we have to be aware of how it plays a role. Okay, so we have our 214 data points. Let's put them into the figure. This is what you get. I've, um, I've 
transport the, X, uh, the Y axis. The reason I've done this is survivorship is bounded. Okay, you either have 100% survivorship, you have zero, you have something in between. Growth is very different. You either have no growth or you have a shed load of growth. Okay, so when you look at the range of data, actually, it exponentially tails off. Okay, there's only a few studies that have extremely high growth rates. So if you log normalize that, you can again compound some of that um, non-linear or, or non-norm distribution. So you get this scatter of data, this landscape of data. And this becomes really useful because now what we can do is we can score this data. Okay? As you go from the bottom left to the top right, remember that horizon of increasing return method? We can start to assign a value going from the bottom left to the top right, and I've simply scored the x and the y axis, and it's the sum of those two numbers. Okay, so we assign a score. So every data point that falls within one of those boxes, we give it that score. And now we can start to really play with the data and do some cool things. So I've just pulled out the Acropora scores and the non Acropora scores, and you start to see the spread of data. The first thing you notice is that um, the medians are. I think they're more or less pretty similar, but the spread of data is very different. So the massive corals have um, much lower score in terms of return on effort. That's not a surprise. Okay? You get a greater return on effort for growing a cropper. I'm not telling you anything new, but I'm using data to explore that. What we can now do is we can start to, so again, play some further games about this and ask questions. Well, just, just growth form over in terms of this return on effort. You know, in terms of trying to re-establish a landscape and a certain type of architecture in our reef system, do we need to think about our return on effort differently? And what you can see here is as you go from the bottom left to the top right-hand side, you can see certain growth morphs are clearly providing a much greater return on effort. If we visualize that in, in a plot, and the dotted line, um, vertical line is the meat score of 214 data points in that landscape, you can start to see that there's some growth morphs that give you a higher return on effort, and some growth morphs a lower return on effort on average. Okay? And again, no surprise the acropora is falling out. What's really interesting, of course, is if you start putting apart the plating corals versus your more ornamental corals that are not plating, um, you see this different return on effort. So what this starts to tell you is if you want to restore a certain balance within your ecosystem, you're clearly going to have to stock your nursery differently to make sure you get the right return on effort. Okay, the same goes for the, for the matters, for example, on the opposite side of the spectrum. Of course, what this hides is the role of species okay, within this end result. So we, we went through this process again and started pulling out the species. So when you start to look at this, okay, I'm not going to talk about the acropolis, they're standing out there on their own, but again, if you go from the bottom left-hand side to the top right-hand side, follow the landscape of increasing return on effort, what you start to see is certain masses start pulling out, okay, to make that a more simplistic way of viewing it and looking at it, if we can just pull up the right-hand side figure a second, again, you can start to pull out where are your massive tanks that have the greatest return on effort, and there's perhaps some real surprises in there. There's things like Montipora that, that um, increasingly um, and persistently give you this high return on effort. Parites, generally a high return on effort. So some really interesting scores um, are produced. And of course, not, not, so, um, not, not such surprising data. So with this information in mind, we've then used this to start stocking our nursery. Um, and this is where we're at to so far. So this is really um, where we're going into the future with this. Um, so as of July, we now have 10 frames installed, we have over 1,500 fragments um, installed, and we have 10 species within 5 genera, and we've populated them based on our landscape of, um, of return and effort, and, and we can actually try and validate this idea based on our growth and survivorship we see of these fragments over time. So it's an exciting opportunity to see if this kind of tool can be of use to practitioners. Um, there are the list of species up there. We have multiple color morphs that presumably will have some sort of an impact in some sense. We've had 100% survival so far. And what's really exciting for us, even though it's winter and the coolest time, we've already had our first, um, our first fragments, our first cohort grafted onto the tiles that we'll be using for our planting. What I do want to say is from August and beyond, I put a little asterisk next to the um, our planting. This is where we're going. We'll be hopefully about 5,000 fragments in the next month or so. Um, we're not kidding ourselves, right? Outplanting is really the biggest challenge, it's the biggest bottleneck. We've heard several talks present that so far. We have a, um, a project, hopefully, that will um, address lots of these problems that you've heard about um, to try and fast track. I can't tell you anything about it, unfortunately, just yet, until tomorrow. Um, and we have um, parallel sites in mind, and also um, cost benefit analysis in terms of our particular project, which, of course, we're, we're very excited to be able to feed that forward into other types of analysis. So with that in mind, I'll wrap up and let you start fulfilling your happy needs. And I would be really happy not only to take questions, but also explore opportunities. One thing I want to say about this site 
is it, it is a facility, it's there to be used to address scientific questions relevant to the Great Barrier Reef about how, when, why we want to restore reefs in a targeted manner of high value site. So if you have particular studies you're interested in, we're really in, you know, willing to have those conversations, we're already working with JCU, for example, about um, ecological impacts and, and artifacts. So with that in mind, thank you, and um, that's a few.